Now, um, there's a, uh, what I want to talk about today um, is this, this really great movie. This is a really, really funny movie. Has, has anyone seen this movie? You know, it's Jonah, Jonah Hill and all those guys. Um, I think about this movie a lot in the last couple months. Um, and the reason is because it starts off, it, it starts off, these buddies are reunited, one flies into LA, they're going to have a great weekend of smoking weed and partying. And then all kinds of weird stuff begins to happen. Because it turns out that it's the apocalypse and the rapture, uh, and many people are left behind, and it's hell on earth. So that's the movie. It, trust me, it is actually really funny. Um, but it's a movie that I'm thinking about all the time these days, because um, we used to have this political system that was kind of going downhill, and polarization was rising, and things you know, were, there were some warning signs, but things basically, basically worked, and we had candidates for president uh, that were both very decent people who, who uh, it's widely agreed either one could have run the country, and then we go from there into an election that provoked much, much stronger feelings. Um, and then from there, uh, we, now it's like all hell is breaking. So we have actual Nazis, actual Nazis coming out of the woodwork on the, uh, on the right, um, and we have people on the left who think it's okay to punch actual Nazis, and not just actual Nazis, but pretty much anyone who strongly disagrees with us is like a Nazi, so it's okay to punch them too. So you've got weird, weird stuff happening on the right and on the left. Uh, and this, this image has gone around quite a lot, of course, the, uh, the, the contradiction that, uh, uh, that uh, of, of students at Berkeley marching for free speech in, 19, in the 1960s and then rioting against it to shut down someone whom they don't, don't want to hear from now. So how can this be? Other, other than it being actually a few months before the rapture, other than that explanation, what is going on? That's what we're here to talk about. So. Um, I'm going to go through six, uh, six ideas. I'm going to try to tell a story about what's happening, and I'll end with what you can, what I think uh, libertarians in particular can do on campus, and then I'll get, we'll have plenty of time for discussion. I want to hear what you think, what you think of the story I've told, and what you think can be done to improve things. So let's start here. <clears throat> so this is Raphael's uh, Academy of Athens. It's, this is the idyllic uh, presentation of what we think life in the you know, ancient, uh, ancient Greece was like. Obviously, they didn't have that great Roman architecture, but there's Plato and Aristotle in the middle, and you see people discussing, arguing the brilliance, the, the respect with which they're debating. I mean, it looks like a very exciting place to be intellectually. Um, in America, we, we have our ideas of college not just from Plato's Academy, but from, from Britain, from Oxford and Cambridge. They have given us the model. So the Anglosphere is, in fact, the problems we're having in America are actually spreading rapidly in the UK, Australia, and Canada. For some reason, there's something about the Anglosphere that is prone to this set of problems I'll be talking about. They're not happening much on the continent. Um, so we have these ideas from Oxford and Cambridge. American universities have these beautiful quads, these lawns in the middle, and we, we have our, our, our images of colleges bucolic time, discussing ideas, guided by uh, learned faculty. Um, but then, uh, it's like, you know, the first signs of the rapture, like weird stuff is happening. So this is data, you've all seen graphs like this from FIRE, about the frequency of campus disinvitations, which begin to spike, they begin to shoot upwards in 2013 and, and into 2014. Um, so I'm going to walk you through the, the, these two years, from 2013 to 2015, which is the period between when you know, Jonah Hill or whoever arrives in LA at the time when the, you know, the, everybody's raptured, like that weird period. That's what we're, we're in now. Um, so, uh, weird stuff is happening and you start getting people on the left even saying, what is going on? I'm being attacked right and left for saying things that I've been saying throughout my teaching career. And suddenly, I'm being attacked from my left-leaning students. Um, Greg Lukianoff uh, had this fantastic idea diagnosing the problem as one in which colleges are teaching students to do the very cognitive mistakes and biases that Greg had learned not to do in cognitive therapy. Greg invited, talked to me about this idea. I thought it was one of the greatest psychological insights I'd ever heard. I agreed to write this article with him. So it comes out in August of 2015, and we thought things are getting bad. It, things are sort of heating up. More weird stuff is happening. But it had only just begun. This was August of 2015. 
Um, in September, the very next month, you start getting all the protests uh, and, and anger at Mizzou, at Missouri, uh, the famous incident with Melissa Click. Uh, but th this is still just the prologue, because it isn't really until Halloween. There's something about Halloween nowadays. Um, that really triggered the explosion. So everybody's, I won't tell the, the Yale story, everybody knows it, um, but it, 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 the, uh, the email from Erica Christakis that led to a confrontation uh, with students in Silliman against her husband, gigantic pro, uh, campus-wide protest march in support of the, of the protesting students and against the Christakises. They uh, immediately, 400 faculty members jump on to support the students, uh, say that, uh, Yale is an oppressive, racist place. We need to make changes. Nobody comes to the Christakis' defense. Um, actually, a month later, 40 professors did, um, but they were mostly from the hard sciences, and the students wrote in various letters about how insensitive they were, how they needed re-education, and one of them actually used the word re-education. So the faculty are overwhelmingly in support, at least those who are willing to speak publicly, overwhelming in support of the protests and against the Christakises. Uh, they submit their demands to Peter Salovey. They say, you have one week. You have seven days to respond. Unbelievably, he accepts their ultimatum and responds with a day or two to spare. Um, and he, while he doesn't give them everything they ask for, it's clear that they basically won. And he says, we have failed you. And Yale commits to, well, they, what they demanded was a new Yale. And while he didn't say that, yes, we will be a new Yale, he did validate their view of Yale. Now this, I believe, was the moment when all the spores were blown out and then they fly out and then they land at universities all over America. So it's Halloween and early November of 2015 is when this all spreads out. Uh, if you go to the demands.org, 80 or so stu uh, universities have these sorts of demands, many of which are unconstitutional or illegal um, for mandatory things that must be done to the faculty and the students. Um, you can see just a little bit, bit of data to show you that we are in a new age since November of 2015. I just did a Google Trends search for safe space, and what you see is the term was in very low frequency until, no, until Halloween of 2015. And then it spikes up again, Halloween of 2016. Um, so, and it, it's a permanently high plateau now. So safe spaces is part of conversations, part of it. I think it was just put in Webster's Dictionary uh, last week or something. It was it entered the, the um, if you, I put in trigger warnings and microaggressions to see the same story. They were rising a bit in 2012, 2013, but it's not until really 2015 that they become much, uh, much more frequent. So these are now, this is the new reality on campus. Not that these are everywhere, and I want to make clear, this stuff is only at four-year residential schools. Most college students don't go to a four-year residential school. They go to a place where they take classes, and then they go home, or they go to work. You don't get these trends when people have multiple moral worlds that they're part of. But when they come, they move, they have a dorm room, and they're in a community for four years, that's when you get this new moral culture. And that's what I want to talk about today. Um, so it's in such a world that you can have this idea that someone's coming to speak, we should riot, throw small explosives, punch people, and light fires. It's not, though, the violent protest that so shocked me. Uh, in fact, when I first read about it, I heard that it wasn't Berkeley students, it was outside agitators. And there are anarchists, there are black bloc, um, they call. So I didn't blame Berkeley, and I, you know, the deans at Berkeley, they, you know, they took a good line. Originally, they said, no, you know, First Amendment, Milo can come speak, we're not gonna stop it. So at first I thought Berkeley did well. Um, <clears throat> but it turns out there was a lot of, I don't know how much, but there was a lot of support for the violence among students. And so one editor at the, uh, the Cal newspaper put together a bunch of op-eds, or a bunch of essays by students defending the violence. Uh, so one, violence helped ensure the safety of students, therefore it was justified. Another one, check your privilege when speaking of protests. Here's a direct quote. Now read, listen to this carefully. Asking people to maintain peaceful dialogue with those who legitimately do not think their lives matter is a violent act. Okay, now there are a lot of things wrong with this. The funny one is that I think this person might be using the word legitimately in a way different from the rest of us who speak English use it. But never mind that. What this person is saying is that peaceful dialogue is a violent act. 
Where have you heard that before? Hmm, war is peace. Freedom is slavery. Things are getting so Orwellian. Now, on the left, people say, my God, we ought to read Orwell because Trump is Orwellian, and there is a lot of truth to that. But people on the right have been saying for a long time, long before these protests, that it's the left that's getting Orwellian. So again, we are in weird times where the extremes, the far left and the far right, are being, well, I would say bizarre or crazy, but first that would be microaggression. Second, it would not be true, because I study moral psychology, and what's happening is crazy. It's straight moral psychology. So in a way, I feel these days, I feel like the scene in Jurassic Park, if you remember, where the, you know, the scientists are taken to the island, and you know, uh, one's looking down, and like, the grass is like, my god, these are prehistoric grasses. And her husband picks her head up and says, you know, look, dinosaur. And so that's the way I feel. So it's very exciting, and it's also terrible. Um, so, that's, uh, uh, that's what has happened. Now let me go into the culture, because this is what is most concerning to me, that a new moral culture is spreading on many college campuses. What is that culture? Everyone's heard of space, safe spaces by now. South Park's been wonderful on this for, you know, for a long time. Um, now, let's be clear. Physical safety is good. Then, you know, I'm 53 years old. Anybody my age remembers you know, there were no car seats, you fought with your siblings in the back seat of the car on long trips, you rolled around, you know, you threw stuff out the window. I mean, we did all kinds of dangerous stuff, and the death rates show it. This childhood's really safe. Very few kids die compared to the old days. So that's all good. I have no, you know, physical safety is a good thing, especially when children are concerned. The problem is that once you begin to worship it, it gets taken too far, and uh, I'm good friends with Lenore Skenazy, and so I'm always, you know, hearing these, you know, she sends me all these, all these things. I, I couldn't find the one. There's like knee pads and elbow pads. Kids have been learning to crawl for millions of years, but now they need all kinds of expensive safety gear because what if they were to bang their head? God forbid they should learn a lesson. Um, and um, safety can be carried too far. This sign was from one of Lenore's uh, uh, blog posts. This is an actual note sent home from a school in Maryland. Dear parents, I'm sending this letter to inform the, such, the community of an event. It seems uh, that a student reported that while at the bus stop, an adult male followed a group of students for about a block. He made no verbal or physical contact. In other words, there was a man, an actual man, walking near some elementary school students. And so this is, you know, you have to set an alarm, you have to file a report. So this is insane. But this is the level of paranoia we have about our kids being snatched or abused. Um, and once the safety culture creeps into emotional safety, this is the Rubicon. This is the terrible, terrible change that is causing so many of the problems. Emotional safety is a terrible idea, or I should say an idea that maybe is good in some limited context, but has morphed to basically warp child development, I believe. Um, my children are uh, often not allowed to run on the playground. That's physical safety. Uh, but there's all sorts. I asked them the other day, have you ever heard the phrase, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never harm me? They never had. My son is 10, he had never heard that. Now, you can, why, why didn't I tell him? Okay, I start, started saying it, but nobody says that anymore. Um, now, what's happening here is called concept creep. A psychologist in Australia, Nick Haslam, wrote a wonderful paper. Um, he's a clinical psychologist, and he analyzes some key concepts in clinical psychology and how their definitions have changed. From the abstract, he says, many of psychology's concepts have undergone semantic shifts in recent years. Concepts that refer to the negative aspects of human experience have expanded their meanings, so they now encompass a much broader range of phenomena than before, and he goes through abuse, bullying, trauma, mental disorder, addiction, and prejudice. Skipping a bit the abstract, he says, I contend that the expansion, so what's the reason why are these terms changing? The reason reflects an ever-increasing sensitivity to harm, reflecting a liberal or progressive moral agenda. In other words, it, it's politically useful to make more people be victims and in, or, in order to damn the oppressors. That's, that's the contention. Reflecting a liberal moral agenda, concept creep runs the risk of pathologizing everyday experience and encouraging a sense of virtuous but impotent victimhood. Um, here, to illustrate it graphically, there's a definition of bullying, and when the bullying research starts in the 1980s, it gets very, uh, it 
really speeds up. Um, and it had three parts to it. It had to be intentional, repeated, with some sort of a link to violence. Not actual violence, but the person had to have some fear that force could be used against them. So it had a very clear meaning. Bullying's a terrible thing. There was, I saw bullying when I was a kid, not of me, but of others. It's horrible. I'm glad people have been working on it and reducing it. The rates are way down. But even as the rates of actual bullying have come down, the definition of bullying has come down so far. And we'll see that in just a minute. Um, and that's why we can now see things like this. We condemn freedom of speech that hurts other people's feelings. Because what's ultimately important is emotional safety. We have to all work to protect each other's emotional safety. Um, and as Nick said, it, it leads to a feeling of virtuous victimhood. Uh, for me, the great breakthrough in understanding what's happening was this paper by two sociologists, uh, Man uh, Campbell and Manning. Um, I read the paper, I, it was like lights were just going off in my head. I summarized it and shortened it. If you go to heterodoxacademy.org, um, I have a, a condensed version of the paper that you can read there. Um, but here's the key idea. They say that many human societies used to be honor cultures. Honor cultures are very common around the world. In an honor culture, people are socialized so that they will shun reliance on law or any other authority, even when it's available. If a gentleman is insulted, he must handle it himself, or he loses honor. He should not go running to the police to say, he insulted me, go punish him. Um, so gentlemen are trying to maintain their honor. Women have a different kind of honor. Honor is sex-typed in an honor society. Um, but the key thing is that a small little thing can provoke a big reaction, because no one can tolerate a stain upon their honor, but then they handle it themselves. Now, a big step forward is when you get larger societies with trade and more mobility, honor culture just doesn't make sense. It would be just kind of weird if, you know, like I live in New York City, and, um, you know, you physically bump into people on the subway, on the street, you know, like every day there's a little something. I have never seen anyone get angry. I've never seen anyone say, watch it, asshole, because it's just, we'll just be stupid. We have a dignity culture in New York, not an honor culture. Dignity exists independently of what others think. A culture of dignity is one in which reputation is less important. It's even commendable to have a thick skin. You're supposed to just shrug it off. It doesn't matter. Just go about your business, live and let live. So this is an incredible way to structure a society that has diversity, that has people who believe different things. People can get along really well because they have thick skin, they ignore the little things. If something really big happens, they don't shoot the person, then they'll go to the police. But it has to be pretty big because sticks and stones will break my bones. But names, I'm just not going to bother. The problem, though, and what they were diagnosing, is that they were emerging, this was written in 2014, they were noticing that on some college campuses, we're seeing a new moral culture, a culture of victimhood, which is characterized by concern with status and sensitivity to slight. So again, little tiny things can provoke a big reaction, just like an honor culture. But, but, people do not handle it themselves. If you perceive a slight, you bring it to the attention of authorities, and so rather than emphasize their strength or inner worth, the aggrieved emphasize their oppression and social marginalization. And here's the biggest idea of all. Every society, in every society, people are trying to get prestige. We're all looking to burnish reputations. In a victimhood culture, there's only two ways to get prestige. One, be a victim. The more you can show and emphasize that you are a victim, the more people will treat you as an important person. But what if you can't show that you're a victim? Two, stand up for victims. How do you stand up for victims? By punishing the hell out of anyone who in any way, shape, or form, even inadvertently, marginalized a member of the victim class. And so this was the culture that they were diagnosing in 2014 as emerging on some college campuses. And so when you have events, you, you've heard about these sorts of things. Someone wrote Trump 2016 on the Emory campus. They didn't just write it once, they wrote it 10 or 20 times. Well, what happens? Did the students who overwhelmingly opposed Trump, did they erase it? No, no. They got together and they went to the president to demand that he find the perpetrators and punish them. Now, writing in chalk, as you know, this is something college students do. Uh, this caused international ridicule of, of Emory University and of America. Uh, students said things like, I was legitimately afraid for my life. Um, so anyway, what is going on here? Um, students who are socialized into a victim culture, it has many destructive entailments. Um, in a victimhood culture, you learn to 
categorize people by race, class, sexual, sexual orientation. This is related to intersectionality theory and intersectionality training that students often get now. So you literally are teaching Americans to judge people by race and gender, evaluate them in that way, and see some groups are good, some are bad. Um, this is going to set you up for eternal conflict and grievance, eternal conflict and grievance, even within within the group of social justice activists. You have eternal conflicts in, uh, about whose diversity is more important. Um, uh, everyone feels like they're walking on eggshells and self-censoring because you can be attacked at the drop of a hat. You don't even know what you've done. Uh, fourth, uh, you get a general sense of safety culture. People act as though words because there's so little violence today in America. Violence rates are way, way down, thank God. Um, but words now, with concept creep, words are now seen as a form of violence, as we saw in the Berkeley case. Um, and as Haslam said, the more you participate in a victimhood and safety culture, the weaker you become, the more morally dependent you become. So this was a sign, this was a trigger warning. Originally it was said that this was at the, uh, at Hofstra University at the Clinton-Trump debate. It turns out it wasn't for the debate, it was for another event, but it was there the night of the debate. It's an actual trigger warning given for students going into, these are Hofstra students going to attend a talk, it was on a social justice topic, but they had to be warned that things could come up uh, that might be triggering, and at the bottom, they have five different agencies that students can go to if they feel triggered. Now, these are 18 to 21 year old students going to a, a political event. Um, but treating them as though they're so fragile, they're gonna need grown up help, well, that's just normal these days. That's what you expect in a culture of safety where it's words that are violence. So that's what we're, I believe what we're dealing with. And that's why it's so interesting sociologically. Um, five years ago, this safety victimhood culture only existed in a few departments and a few universities. Now it's much more widespread, just in the last few years. Okay, where did it come from? Why did we get this? I think there are six different lines. I'm just gonna go through it very briefly because this is what so fascinates me, um, is that there are many causes and they've all come together in the last two years. So very briefly, you have to look at what's been happening to universities. How have universities changed? And then, what's happening to American uh, high school kids, high school students before they arrive at university? So very briefly, um, America has been polarizing, as you know. So that's the polarization of the House and Senate. A big drop in the mid-20th century. It was high after the Civil War. And it's been skyrocketing since the 80s. It keeps going up and up and up. So Congress is extremely polarized. But that's political elites. What really matters is the people. Are Americans polarized? The answer is yes. Um, not so much if you look at their issue views, but if you look at what they think of each other, if you look at cross-partisan <coughs> hostility, the numbers are really bad. So this is from the American National Election Survey. The blue line is what Democrats think of the Democratic Party. Red is what the Republicans think of the Republican Party on the top. Uh, and that's so back in the 70s. This is a feeling thermometer where 100 is you feel very warmly, very positive. Zero is very cold, very negative. As you see, attitudes towards the parties have been consistently positive within each party. Now, the last time this was taken was, I think, 2010 or so. So uh, people, or 2014, rather. So people might be more negative about their parties now. But um, the key thing to look at is more towards the other party, the cross-partisan ratings. And the first thing to note is that they're actually not that bad. So in the 70s and 80s, you know, you ask Republicans, what do you think of Democrats? And they say, slightly negative overall. I mean, some people hated them, but it, it wasn't the blind hatred that there is today. It was slightly negative. And it begins drifting downward slowly, as you see. It's only in the Bush and Obama years, it's only since 2000, that it's plummeted. And again, these numbers are like four or five years old now. I mean, now they'd be like negative 20 if the scale could go negative. Um, and so that's the point, first point, is the whole country is polarizing. What's happening at universities? Well, since the 90s, the universities have been purifying. This is a graph of political orientation of professors. Now, this is all professors. This includes the engineering school, the, you know, farm school, the agriculture school, the, the dental school, everything. Um, so the ratio of left to right is only, it's close to one to one. In the, in the 1980s, there was only, you know, more, the blue line is uh, liberals, the, red, the pink is conservatives. So it used to be kind of close. Now, not in the English department, but the point is, at a university, like, there were almost as many people on the right as on the left. Um, and it's only in the 90s that it really spreads out to the point where people on the left totally predominate. In my own area in psychology, uh, I wrote a paper with some colleagues, and we gathered every available piece of information on the politics of psychology professors. Here's what we found. 
Um, as late as 1996, um, it was a, only a four to one ratio. In 1960, a study was done asking people who they voted for, and uh, four to one they voted for Kennedy over Nixon, and then it asked them to recall who did you vote for. Uh, and about two to one they voted Democrat in the previous. So psychology has always leaned left. That's not really a problem, because as long as there are some people on the right, you can count on them raising objections. If someone says something that's just overtly partisan and, and is not backed up by the facts, but after the early 90s, things really, really change. This is the ratio now. And just four months ago, we got a new data point. It's, it keeps going up. The point is, there are essentially no conservatives in psychology. You can say, if you say something that is pleasing to the left about race, gender, immigration, any other issue, it's likely to get waved through to publication. People won't ask hard questions. They like it, they want to believe it. It'll get waved in. Whereas if you have a finding that they don't like, Boy, are people going to be good at finding flaws in it. So we have a real, there's a real research legitimacy problem in the social sciences in that well, it's, even if nobody is, themselves is politically biased and, and even if, if people are trying to be good scientists, the field is going to produce an unbalanced body of work. Um, so we have rising political pressures, rising purification of the faculty. And as this is happening, related to it, we have a change in the purpose of education. Um, universities, I believe, uh, elite universities, are now taking on social justice as their telos. Telos, the, you know, Aristotle used the word quite a lot to refer to the end or purpose or goal of something. So the telos of a knife is to cut, and if this knife doesn't cut well, then it is not a good knife. What's the telos of a university? Uh, when I went to Yale in 1981, it says above the main gate, Phelps Gate, it says, Lux et Veritas, light and truth. We are here to find truth. And this goes back to, this is our heritage, all the way back to Plato and, Arist and uh, Socrates. Um, but over time, what I've observed uh, since, it's, it's, so I've been, uh, I started graduate school in 1987, um, and what I've observed happening is a gradual replacement of truth with a sort of a more activist agenda. The point of college is to change. Uh, you see quotes from Marx around the, 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 the point is not to understand the world, the point is to change it, is a common phrase. Um, and not just any change, it's social justice in particular. And so what I'm trying to do, what I'm hoping can happen, is that eventually we can create a schism in which those universities that really want to continue pursuing the truth can do so, but we have to separate them from those that are committed to social justice as their highest good. Um, <clears throat> now, the, I just, I'll just introduce a little bit of psychology here. Uh, one of the most important things about human morality, I believe, is that we evolve this capacity to be religious. It's a, it's a part of human nature that we make things sacred and then we circle around them. Doesn't matter if you think you're an atheist or a Catholic, if we all have minds that will make certain people or principles or books sacred. We treat them with reverence, we circle around them, and then we can trust the people who circled with us. We all sh share the same worship. That, I believe, is the evolutionary logic behind it. It was part of our evolution of tribalism, and so we are the descendants of successful tribalists. Not so much libertarians, you guys, it's really hard to organize, you're less tribal. But everybody else out there is in one of these tribes. Although, you know, you've got, you know, uh, Randians and others that are kind of tribal. Um, so, but if you think about it, as people circle, people circle something sacred, it creates an electric charge, uh, they bind together. Uh, it doesn't have to be a religious object. The flag, obviously, is treated as a religious object. Um, what do we treat, make sacred at a university? Well, Truth, right? I mean, that's you know what it says on the logos. Truth is what we're supposed to circle around. But increasingly, I believe this has not been true anymore. Increasingly, what we circle around in universities is victims. That they are sacred. Victims are sacred. And I mean that literally, like the psychology of sacredness is applied to victims. And so the three groups that are mostly the, uh, the, 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 the focus uh, obviously race. Uh, how many of you were in Carrot's talk before? Raise your hand if you were in Carrot's talk. Okay, a number of you. Uh, so these are really difficult conversations to have. And of course, I am in no way saying that these people are not victims, that they're not indignities. So I, I'm, I'm not dismissing concerns. I'm not dismissing claims of uh, systemic racism. I'm just pointing out that the, re the quasi-religious conflicts that we have on campus nowadays tend to revolve around these three issues primarily these three groups. There are other groups as well that sometimes come up, not as often. And then as part of this moral revolution that we've been going through the last two years, 
Um, now, Muslims are, are a seventh group, and Islamophobia is one of the biggest words on campus. Uh, obviously, transgender issues came uh, after, after uh, gay marriage was legalized, the fa attention turned to, uh, to trans uh, transgender issues. And then, of course, Black Lives Matter um, and the, you know, the, the issues that Karak mentioned, that, that horrible year where we all saw those horrible videos of black men being killed. So there are good reasons, historical reasons, why things are changing. It's fascinating the way they're changing, but this, I believe, is the sacredness landscape of elite American universities. And once something is made sacred, what that means is no trade-offs. You cannot, you have to have an irrational, you have to show an irrational commitment to defend them. You can see this most easily on the right, where uh, conservatives have an irrational, they will defend to the death, the flag, the Bible, they'll prosecute anyone that desecrates them. Uh, on the left, of course, people do it too. I mean, you know, we don't, it would be sacrilege to tell a Martin Luther King joke. So you, you, each side has its sacred objects. And this, I believe, is what gets us to Berkeley. Because once victims are sacred, Milo comes in, and while I don't think Milo is, is racist or, I, well, I don't think he's racist or sexist, but boy, does he say nasty things about a variety of people, he made fun of a transgender person, so Milo is a troll, Milo comes in, and his whole shtick is to piss on your sacred values. That's what he does. And if that's what he does, then we must stop him at any cost. Uh, many schools are, are um, embracing this. Brown has declared itself to be the leading social justice university. The president literally said that we have a bedrock commitment to social justice. Bedrock means that's the foundation, that's what we build on. The faculty came right back and said, hooray, we applaud the, the call of the president to unite around a university agenda of social justice. Note the language. Unite around, let us all circle around our sacred God, social justice. Um, uh, Brown launched a hundred million dollar inclusivity plan. That's a lot of money uh, in, uh, in academic circles. What's happening, I believe, is that the, we, now the religion is around diversity and inclusion. So as you see this term, diversity and inclusion, is rising up. Um, and I compared it to multiculturalism. That was the dominant word when I was in college. Multiculturalism is on the way out. It's being replaced by diversity and inclusion. That is the sacred obligation of everybody on campus, is diversity and inclusion. Um, so to sum up, social justice has become the most sacred goal for many on campus as the faculty have become politically purified at a time of rising cross-partisan hate. So imagine a pressure cooker building up, or imagine a giant electromagnet where the charge, the polarizing charge, has gone from 100 volts to a million volts over the course of the last 10 years. So here we are, here's our campus, politically purified and charged. Welcome incoming class, what's gonna happen to you? So in March, these students, these 17, 18-year-old students, um, what happens to them? Well. It's not like they were uncharged particles in the first place. They come in um, having been raised in a, in a particular way. So um, I was born in 1963. Until the early 1980s, normal childhood in America, like everywhere else, was after school, you'd go out and play. We would ride our bikes to school from the time we were eight, and then after school, we'd, you know, a bunch of us would go off to a park, have rock fights, we'd do all sorts of things. Uh, and then you'd come home for dinner. That's the way childhood has always been until the 1980s. So 1979 was one of the gigantic high-profile child abduction cases, uh, just three blocks south of where I live in Greenwich Village. Eitan Pates, six years old, asks his parents if he can walk around the block, not even crossing the street, just can I walk around the block to take the bus alone? And sure, you know, he, you know, he, he let's encourage independence in him, or let's just assume he can, and he was never seen again. And I think the, you know, the, the trial, fi the guy was finally convicted, like last week I think it was, the case is finally resolved. Uh, but this put the fear, uh, the fear of abduction into a lot of people. But that was just one event. Um, now, the, this is the way I grew up, was looking, Aton Pace with the first face on the milk cartons that many of us grew up, the older people here grew up with. Missing children, missing children. You know what? There were only a few missing children. The abductors were almost always the non-custodial parent. That's who abducts children. You know, there are a couple a year that are by strangers. But we all grew up, not well, those younger than me grew up with the idea that there are people out there, you know, if there's a man walking behind some kids, he might abduct them. So we have rise in parental fear in the 80s, and parents respond by restricting uh, unsupervised play. Now there really was a giant crime wave, a giant, giant crime wave from the 60s that peaked in 1992. 
uh, and then it, you know, it goes down after that. So there really was a crime wave, and there were high-profile abductions, so it's not that there was nothing they were reacting to. But the little thing that really was there was magnified a thousandfold by cable TV, which comes in in 1981. So it's the early 80s is the transition time, when society is getting a little more dangerous, that's true, but cable TV freaks us all out, freaks the parents all out, because now it's all crime all the time. You know, any time a kid is abducted or a, or a young woman is murdered and they, they don't know where, or you know, it was on it was on TV all the time because of t cable TV. So the eighties really begins to freak parents out, and they change parenting norms. It's now illegal in many places to let your kids walk to school or play in the park. You can literally be arrested. You can have your children taken away from you because what if they're abducted? It's irresponsible. So kids stay home, they do screen time. Your backyard's fine, nobody's ever gonna stop you letting your kid out of your property. But if he steps off your property, you can be arrested. Now it's not state law necessarily, it's, depend it's how the town enforces it, but that's what often happens. It turns out, kids need thousands of hours, many thousands of hours of unsupervised time to learn how to live without their parents. So when they go off to college, it's not the first time they're unsupervised, um, and they're not getting it anymore. So you think about, like, you know, I, my kids are seven and ten, we read them all these stories. All the stories involve kids going out of the zone of parental protection. That's what childhood stories are about. They have adventures, they face dangers, they surmount them, they come back stronger, they've learned lessons, they've grown up. So Lenore Skenazy, who runs, wrote the book Free Range Kids, she's wonderful on this, and she's so perverse, she's so funny. So she has, she's about to start a contest where you ask uh, kids to draw covers of books if they had happened now. And so it's things like, oh, the places you won't go. <laughs> the Playdates of Huckleberry Finn, Harold and the Purple Sofa, Encyclopedia Brown solves the worksheet, <laughs> Harry Potter and the Sit Still Challenge, Dory and the Ford Explorer, and The Lion, the Witch, and the Field Trip Chaperone. So kids today just are not getting the chance. They don't get the chance to have adventures, to learn to work out conflicts, to get into fights and resolve them themselves. They don't have that chance. And so, we, so okay, so that's, that's one of the major features. Another one related to that, because we have zero tolerance policies for bullying, zero tolerance is usually a bad thing to have. If you have a zero tolerance policy and concept creep, it's a disaster. Because it's one thing if you say we have no tolerance for actual bullying. But if you say, we have no tolerance for concept crept bullying, which is essentially hurt feelings, we have zero tolerance in this school for hurt feelings. Are you serious? You're gonna raise kids with zero tolerance for hurt feelings? You're insane. Because, look, I just, if you just Google bullying, uh, Google image search, here's what you get. Okay, assault, destroying things, sure, zero tolerance for that, absolutely. Uh, Cyberbullying, okay, okay. Um, hitting, uh, Threats, okay. Uh, name calling? We're not gonna let kids call each other names. Mean looks, you cannot give a mean look. And we're gonna have video cameras on you and we're gonna expel you if you give a mean look. I mean, that's, they don't literally expel them for a mean look, but the point is, mean looks now are counted as part of bullying. Um, teasing, teasing is a normal, natural part of friendship. So kids are living in this hyper-regulated, paranoid, concept crep, no hurt feelings, childhood, and then we send them off to college. All along, they learn the lesson. If someone does give you a mean look, if someone does tease you, don't handle it yourself. Go get the adult in charge. There's a proper punishment for this. So then the last thread I'll mention is social media virtue signaling. Facebook opened, up, uh, its, opened itself up in 2006 to 13 year olds. So the first true Facebook natives uh, only graduated in 2014. Now things begin to get weird in 2013 to 2015. That's really the transition period. So I can't say that this is definitely a part of it, but if you're raised with this zero tolerance for bullying, no hurt feelings, yet you're on the internet all the time, and what do people on the internet do? They form mobs to attack others over small things as part of their victimhood culture. So this is the way, this is the preparation that kids have. They have to constantly be showing which side they're on, which side they're on. They have these, they, they live in a world of mob punishment. So, you put it all together, you have the universities hyper-polarizing over political matters, you have students coming in unprepared to live on their own because they've always, they've been forced to be uh, moral dependents. Um, and um, what's the result? The result, I believe, is students who are, they feel that violence has been done to them 
if Milo comes and speaks in an auditorium. So why is this so bad for students? Um, I'll just go through this very briefly. Obviously, if your professors are afraid to speak, then you're not getting a provocative education. I can tell you right now, those of you who are in college, you are not hearing nearly as much provocative material as you would have five years ago. I hear this from professors all over. They say, I'm pulling videos, I don't make jokes, I don't, you know, we're all pulling stuff because it's just not worth the hassle of being dragged in to an administrative hearing over, over your teaching. Um, students say the same thing, I'll just very briefly, um, a student at Smith explained how I learned, along with every other student, to walk on eggshells for fear that I may say something offensive. That is the social norm here at Smith. Um, in my book, The Happiness Hypothesis, I talk, I have a chapter on the uses of adversity. It's a great truth that what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. Um, this is known east and west, uh, that in order to toughen people up, they need to be exposed to adversity. Um, Nassim Taleb has a wonderful book, Anti-Fragile. Systems that get stronger when they are banged around, when they face adversity, they actually get stronger. That's more than resilience. They actually need negative experiences in order to grow. Things like bones, the immune system, and basically children. If you protect your children for 18 years, you've created children that are not ready to leave the home. If you wrap them in bubble wrap, and then you send them off to school where you're always hovering nearby, and then you send them off to college and you're helping them with everything, what do you think is going to happen? So colleges are now, I believe, making students fragile. Now obviously parents and high schools are doing it, but colleges, which ought to be the place where that stops, are just four more years of the same thing. And so we're seeing um, increasing uh, demand for mental health services. Um, this, I think, says it all. Hannah Holborn Gray, the University of Chicago, education should not be intended to make people comfortable. It's meant to make them think. So look for that when you shop for a, well, you're already in college, but advise people to go to Chicago. It's one of the best out there. Um, so I'll skip over why it's bad for America. It's kind of obvious. Uh, when, you know, when this culture goes to work, it's going to be constant litigation and, and, and vindictiveness. Um, millennials, as you may have heard, are much more negative on free speech. They're much more willing to restrict speech. Um, in a country that is so effectively polarized, if we have people who can't tolerate being in the same room or the same company as people who have different values than them, how can you have a democracy? How can you have diversity? If you value diversity, you should be very concerned about victimhood culture. Um, I'll skip this. Um, so this is why I actually kind of think this could be the end. This could be the end of liberal democracy. I wouldn't bet on it. It's never right to bet against America. And I'm not saying it's going to happen. But for the first time in my life, I, you know, this could continue to escalate to the point where our democratic institutions break down. Um, this, this was in place before Trump came along, although, of course, Trump is, exa is exacerbating things quite a lot. So what you can do. Please visit heterodoxacademy.org. It's, a, it's a, a collection of, we now have 400 professors um, who have come together to say, we think that we actually need some viewpoint diversity. Uh, click on our resources tab, and we have a whole bunch of resources for you. Um, you can go to our college care pack. We have a quick guide to what's going on, uh, how to think about viewpoint diversity. You can get, um, you can buy mugs and t-shirts. You can look up, we have a, a guide to colleges. You can look up, um, we've rated, uh, variety of criteria for how likely you are to find viewpoint diversity at a school. So the best schools, as far as we can tell, are Chicago, Purdue, William & Mary, Wash U, Carnegie Mellon, George Mason. Uh, Princeton is the best Ivy. Um, the worst schools in America of the major ones seem to be Georgetown, uh, sorry, Oregon, Georgetown, Harvard, NYU, my own school, Rutgers, uh, Missouri. So you can go there, you can look up how your school is doing, uh, you can buy swag. Uh, but here's the main thing I want to give you, those of you who are college students. Um, we have an initiative called the Heterodox U Initiative. We give you sample texts to introduce to your student government or faculty senator anywhere, um, and just urge them to do three things. Adopt the Chicago principles on free expression, implement a non-obstruction policy, meaning protests can't shut people down. You can protest, you can wave signs, but you can't stop a person from speaking or others from listening. And lastly, improve, please, you know, please, uh, university, give us some viewpoint diversity. It's a very simple one. Um, uh, an editorial at Harvard, the students right after the election, they actually asked Harvard, please give us more viewpoint diversity. Cornell just voted on one last week. Uh, it was turned down. Cornell student government voted down an initiative uh, because they said that your diversity isn't important as our diversity. And so, no, we're not going to do that. 
Um, so libertarians are, I believe, I think I meant O negative blood, but you know, the kind that like isn't rejected. So conservatives are poison. Conservatives are seen as just racists, Milo and Trump. Uh, but libertarians, as far as I can tell, you guys aren't really hated. You're sort of like, they, like the left looks at you kind of warily, but like they don't hate you. Is that right? Yeah. So. Which is good, yeah, okay, you're confusing, good, but that's an opening, that's an opening. Um, Heterodox Academy, what we learned is that while there are very few conservatives out there in the academy, there are actually a lot of libertarians and centrists. So that's the main kind of diversity that we have to work with, people not on the left, but not on the right. So libertarians and centrists. And this is not about having conservatives in the academy, what we need is to not have orthodoxy. So the more you guys can raise your voices and question things, the better. Um, so, in sum, what I urge you to do, those of you who are college students or who have uh, children who are college students, go to Heterox Academy, learn about viewpoint diversity, see our guide to colleges, find partners, whatever you do, don't just make it be the Students for Liberty group, try to find like newspaper editors or others who believe in the value of viewpoint diversity. Um, in, well, we have a whole bunch of initiatives, um, and invite the best speakers. Don't invite trolls, invite the best speakers to campus, uh, and challenge people to come listen. So uh, that is my suggestion to you. And I think libertarians in particular um, just automatically resonate with this logo. I just I put it on because I just thought, oh, this will totally speak to the libertarians. So, all right, thank you.